All right, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're connecting from. Uh, welcome to the Genoa Sunfast 3300 webinar. It is just 3 p.m. here on the East Coast of the United States, and it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you all to, uh, to this Genoa Sunfast 3300 webinar um, that we are conducting live uh, here uh, uh, today. So, um, just a couple of logistical things that I would like to, to share with you today as we get started with this webinar. All the uh, uh, attendants are in listen-only mode, uh, which means that uh, only the panelists will be able to, uh, to speak um, to keep the conversations as uh, clear as possible. Um, however, um, there is a fantastic system on GoToWebinar for all of you to be able to send questions as we go through the presentation of the, uh, the SunFast uh, 3300. If you look on your uh, little control panel of the GoToWebinar, you'll see a little uh, a question mark, and by clicking on this, it'll open up a window in which you can type your questions, and, uh, and those questions will, uh, will be available for the panelists. So I'll be moderating the questions and, uh, and basically reading them out uh, so that everyone can hear them, and then we'll address them uh, as best we can. We probably won't be able to get to all the questions today, but don't worry. Uh, we actually have a recording of all the questions that are asked. And uh, if we don't get to your specific question, uh, we will get back to you on email um, after, the, uh, after the, uh, the webinar here so that we can answer these questions uh, for, for you all. So uh, um, I'm going to be uh, in a minute introducing our panelists today and, uh, and then uh, explaining to you a little bit how we're going to structure this uh, this hour-long uh, webinar today. We were very, very excited uh, for it, and, uh, and, and uh, we were absolutely ready to start. So um, I would like to start by introducing our, our panelists today. Um, we have uh, here, and uh, you can see them on the top of the screen, just above the presentation. Um, I will start by introducing my colleague and coworker, Mike Coe. Um, Mike is a product specialist at uh, Genoa America, and he's also been a, um, a project manager, if you will, for the introduction of the SunFast 3300 here in, uh, in North America. Mike brings a ton of experience uh, uh, to um, our project here. Um, he's competed in pretty much every major offshore event that there is on the East Coast of, uh, of the United States. And, uh, and he's got a lot of experience in multiple different rating roles in the, in the US. So Mike is, uh, is a, a full part of the, of the Genoa American team based in Indianapolis, uh, Maryland. We also have uh, on the panel today, it is my great pleasure to welcome Ken Reed, the president of North Sales. Ken, thank you very much for being with us. You need no introduction, but in case people forgot, uh, you've competed three times in the America's Cup. Uh, you've also competed in the Ocean Race, formerly known as the Volvo Ocean Race, three times. Um, you, you are probably uh, the most accomplished and, and celebrated sailor and yachtsman uh, out there. Um, it is really our pleasure to have you on the panel uh, today. Thank you very much. Ken, uh, 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 we would like you to hear from you just a couple words of introduction. Well, thanks. Thanks uh, to both of you. It's great to be here, especially after spending a fair chunk of time on the 3300 um, this past November when life seemed a little, little bit more normal. Um, hopefully we're getting back to that normal situation. Hopefully everybody's safe and that's the that's the priority right now, safe and healthy. And uh, like all other people probably on this webinar, I, I just can't wait to get back on the water just like all the rest of you. Absolutely, Ken. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. So uh, for those of you who, who may not know me, I'm Nick Harvey. I'm the president of Genoa America. And uh, and again, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to uh, to this live webinar this afternoon. Um, so, just a little bit of logistics for the, uh, the, the webinar. We're going to be conducting this webinar and this presentation of the SunFast 3300 in four different sections. And um, I'll put it on the screen here, um, the four different sections, so that if you have a question that's specific to one or the other of the sections, maybe you can hold off until we get to this particular section, and, uh, and that way we'll be able to address the questions as they, uh, as they come along in the right, uh, the right sections. So the, the first topic of conversation will be what sets the boat apart. We'll talk a little bit about you know, the boat uh, um, uh, internationally, and then we'll talk about some of the things that we're doing um, here in North America specifically, since we are conducting this webinar from, from North America. 
We'll talk a little bit about uh, the optimization of the ORC rule. Um, I think a lot of uh, uh, people who have known about the SunFast program know uh, that the boat has been uh, optimized for IRC for a long time. Um, the predecessors of the 3300, like the 32 and the 36. We'll talk a little bit about the performance specifically um, to, uh, to try to understand um, what is you know, what is the boat like sailing. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about the plans in the future, specifically in North America, um, since we have the team here from North America. Again, there's lots of events going on in Europe as well. And I know some of you are joining us from Latin America and we're um, hoping uh, that there'll be lots of events with the 3300 in Latin America. So again, if you try to remember those four sections, and then we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, about these and answer your questions as they uh, as they come along. So let's get things started. And uh, Mike um, uh, and Kenny, I'll be directing different questions uh, at you both, and uh, and hopefully we cover a lot of information about uh, about these uh, these topics. So uh, you know, talking about what sets the boat apart, Mike. I'll start with you. Uh, uh, we heard a lot on the 3300 about uh, the hull concaves. So to a lot of us, it means uh, 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 not much. Tell us a little bit about what those hull concaves are and what the two designers of the boat have been wanting to, to do with this hull concaves. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, one of the one of the things I really like about um, the Genoa sailboat range in total is that every boat has, you know, the big idea that really sets it apart. Uh, and for the 3300, that idea is the the hull concaves, which I'll get an image for you. You can see the bow right there. It's essentially a, um, a depressed section, uh, one in the bow and one in the stern. Um, and what they do is allow uh, us to manipulate the water line of the boat when sailing. You know, we're all used to using fullness of a hull to 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 trim the hull in the water. You know, that is say, you know, if we want a specific part of the boat to maybe float higher. Um, we would make that part of the hull more full. Well, this sort of turns that idea on its head where um, you, take a, you take a section of the hull and you take some of the fullness away, even recessing it in the hull, and it makes that part of the, the hull sink a little bit in the water. Um, on this boat, you see uh, we have a, a bow concave and a stern concave. And the concept mm -hmm. there being we get the bow section to sink in the water a little bit in light air, and as every Racer knows you, you get the bow of the boat in the water in light air. Uh, it reduces wetted surface, makes the water line shorter, um, increases your potential uh, speed and performance in light air. And then in heavy air, when the boat's downwind and ripping along planing, uh, you want to get the stern section um, sunk in the water and locked in to make the boat more controllable at high speeds. So it's you know sailing super fast, but also you know, super in control as well. So that's what that those really allow you to do is take advantage of those two extreme modes. And Mike, if I'm not mistaken, that's unique on a boat of this size, right? Yeah, you know, we're definitely the first boat builder to do it from a, uh, you know, at, at a production level. Um, it's a concept that Guillaume Verdier uh, brought to the project after proofing it, you know, on some bigger high-tech ocean racing boats um and some america's cup boats you know and they use it on um, um on foil designs uh, as well so it's it's not a new concept but it certainly is new brought to the uh, production level of the marketplace so talking about guillaume verdier uh perfect transition mm -hmm. to, to lead into a question for kenny who has worked with guillaume on, on several other projects before uh jumping on and, and working with us on the sunfast 3300 kenny you, you've sailed a lot of boats you t tell us a little bit about what do you feel on the boat with this hull concaves, for example? Well, <clears throat> hull concaves aren't, you know, they're really uh, contortions to the hull, right? And, you know, it, it took somebody like uh, a Guillaume uh, Verdier to figure this all out. It, a lot of people, some people might, might uh, on, your, on the webcast right now, might understand like back to the IOR days where hull contortions were done strictly for rules to, you, you were you were torquing the hull uh, shape in certain areas, pretty ugly, as a matter of fact, in ugly ways. But that that was there was kind of a rule beating um, performance game. Well, this is different. This is a this is a hydrodynamic performance game. This is um, 
to go back to well, Comanche, Guillaume and I first worked together, and and Guillaume was a, a one of the principal designers for for the Comanche project, which I put together. And uh, I remember first seeing the the I went up to Maine and I was checking out um, the hull as, as it popped out of the uh, as it popped out of the mold, and I called them from there. I'm like, Are, "Have you been drinking a lot lately, or <laughs> what's your what's your situation here? This thing is all messed up in the back end. What did you do wrong?" And and that's when he explained the whole thing to me. And uh, you know what, guys like Guillaume, you know, there's this younger generation of really, really, really smart um, naval architects uh, out there, and they just figure stuff out and then you trust them and then you get on their boats and they go fast and the amazing thing about this is you don't feel and you don't really feel any of it it feels like a good sailing boat uh, it's not like oh wow i can really feel that hull hollow working now or not working now it's nothing like that it's just it's really a hydro performance gain that uh that you look at all the modeling and and it it clearly works. You look at the you look at the modeling and it works. Um, you get on the boat and you kind of hope it works because you really can't feel it. That's awesome, Kenny. Thanks thanks for that. And obviously, obviously, you know, I I love your reaction when you see that all come out of the mold the first time. It's uh, it, it's clearly uh, clearly. I thought you've been doing a little too much of this while it was in the boat, you know. Yeah, for when sure. Well, that's that's known for that. So, yeah. So, uh, another question on on specifically, you know, what sets the boat apart from maybe other types of boats in this in this category is the the, the rig and the sail plan. Mike, Mike, I'll start with you, and I think you have a, a couple supporting slides as well. And then Kenny, feel free to, to jump in as well. But so the, the rig is is actually positioned quite far aft for a thirty three foot boat. Um, yeah. Why do we do that, and, and what impact does it have on uh, on the performance and the overall architecture of the boat? Yeah, I mean, you know, Nick and in, in you know, and, and Kenny obviously is a very accomplished sailmaker, so I'll have come to say on this as well. But I mean, the basic idea behind getting the rig aft in the boat is to uh, is all about balance. You know, the this boat is designed to be an offshore and distance racing boat, which means that there's going to be, you know, a lot of reaching. Um, and so we need to balance the boat for reaching, uh, which means that we need to promote um, getting the largest size head sails and spinnakers that we that we possibly can. So when the boat's pressed over on its ear, you know, it wants to it wants to rip straight along as opposed to, you know, wanting to wind check, what have you, right? So in in thinking that way we want to be able to get as much sail area in the front of the sail plan as we possibly can uh, and to do that you know you gotta you have to move the rig aft to accommodate so the the rig is aft the keel is aft and it's all about kind of promoting the reaching performance is that what you think kenny Kenny, what yeah, was your again mind? well it, it is absolutely the trend in um in in these higher in these higher speed uh, new designs. The trend is rig further and further and further back. You know, I've seen some, you know, in multi hulls, for example, I've seen mass well back uh, beyond 50% of the of the middle of the boat. So if you wow. think about, you look at this bo the bottom uh, diagram of the of the deck layout. You know, a lot of boats um, have gone from almost a, 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 a triangle pie shape into a much fuller forward section, in in Part of the part of the reason it works is you move that sail plan aft as well as the keel aft, like Mike said, mm -hmm. to keep the center of effort correct um, or the center of balance correct. But um, yeah. you're heeling over on a on a big full section of the boat that you don't tend to heel over and dig the bow in. And, and these boats, those full sections forward, combined with the rig way aft, the boat heels over and very often the bow it feels like the bow is popping up rather than heeling over and and, and digging the bow in and that's really a, a big trend of a lot of uh these new fast boat co concepts from you know a boat this size to the mochas to the comanches of the world it's really uh it's really a big trend and it's utilizing the whole deck space too so you got the right head stay all the way out on the bow and the and the boom you know I, I think a couple of these latest mainsails we're doing 
um, they have no kind of IRC implications to them, more ORC, and, and we're going to go right to the end of the boom. So you're really using the whole four and a half space to pile some sale area on on a slightly lower aspect ratio um, sale plan. So it is the trend, and it's right. not going anywhere. Yeah, and it's no. definitely, and then, definitely something. What else would you want to add, Mike? Well, I was just going to say that it, you know, it allow you know that combined with the twin rudder platform. Um, which isn't that, you know, which is pretty uncommon in North America, really provides for, you know, minimum drag when everything balances out together. So, you know, when you're, you know, when you're, when you're rocked up on a pretty strong reach, the boat wants to go forward as opposed to, you know, needing to use a lot of rudder to keep it going straight, you know? Yeah, for sure. So obviously, you know, the, everything, the keel and everything is brought back aft as well. And, and uh, we have a, a very cool keel design uh, on, on this boat as well. So, um, Kenny and, and Mike, we, we were talking a little bit about, you know, the, the ORC rating rule, for example, and that's sort of the, the, the second chapter in this conversation here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is to do with the sail plan and how to optimize the sail plan for, for ORC. So can you, can you run us down, like, what are the, uh, the, the, main, uh, the main things that are different in ORC maybe than in IRC on the, on the sail plan? And before you guys jump into the answer, uh, we actually had a question come in on the uh, on the chat there, uh, asking what was the sail that was on the uh, the first slide, the first photo where we see the boat uh, from the front. So maybe as you guys answer that question about the specific toggle back and forth, Mike, between the sail plan and that picture, and, and Kenny, you were driving the boat. That's you and Susie Leach there on the boat. Tell us about that sail, and then you can dovetail into the ORC. Well. It you guys, this is the primary reason I'm here is because of how much fun I had double-handed sailing um, in that race and how much fun, how much I'm looking forward to double-handed sailing uh, this summer. And, and just so happens it's kind of with this social distancing thing, uh, this might be some of the, 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 the racing that we're allowed to do in the not too distant future. So this is a Helix um, Code Zero and a Helix uh, in, in Stasel, um, you know, working like a jib Stasel. And both of these sails um, have the helix structure built into the sail, so they have really minimal, minimal luff ropes. Um, uh, so we can do helix in both paneled sails, which this is, this is a carbon uh, laminate, uh, or 3DI, which the staysail and the mainsail um, is on this, on this boat. So it was really cool. It, it, it was something that we, uh, that we really wanted to do for this boat prior to the race, because this race can have some reaching to it. And it can have some windy kind of broad reaching to it. So it, it, it's meant for a whole bunch of different purposes. We can actually go upwind in super light air and go downwind in 30 knots with the, with this sail. So so uh, that's the that's the trend. These are these are fun sails to have on board. You used the sail a lot in that race, right? This this code zero. You were in it for 10 hours or something, right? Yeah, so we used this sail for probably half the race, and then it got a little broad, a little broader, and we had a kite up. But then the squall started at night, so my goodness, I we lost count of how many sail uh, changes we did between <laughs> this sail and the kite and the jib. It was like, it was like the wind gods were saying to Susie and, and myself, "We're gonna kick your ass here tonight, just to make sure you <laughs> really want to do this." It, it, going you gotta forward. earn it. <laughs> So that was the uh, that was the Fort Lauderdale of all our viewers out there, Kenny. That was our Fort Lauderdale, the Key West race uh, that took place in January in Florida. Yeah, it's really it's really um, it was the first well it was the first dabble into double handed racing I've ever done. And uh, teaming up with uh, you guys at Genoa was first of all a blast and, and really fun. Um, but it's it's also it was purposeful for U.S. sailing. You know, with the announcement of the Olympic. Uh, the Olympic double-handed offshore event, the 2024 Olympics, everything kind of tied together. And although there were just a couple boats in the race, we're supposed to be four or five, and a couple dropped out at the last minute. Um, it, it just got it got a little bit of momentum. It got some people talking about this double-handed thing. And I am not a pioneer of double-handed. As a matter of fact, there's lots of people in North America, and France, and England, Australia, all around the world who have been doing this for a long, long time. But I'm definitely going to be one that jumps on the bandwagon. So, uh, you know, it, it's really, it's far more fun than I ever imagined it would be. Um, and uh, I'm ready to do more. And, uh, I really am. I, I can't wait to do more. 
we're, we're ready for you to do more, no doubt about that, and push the sport. <laughs> yeah. So back, back to the SEAL plan and, and the ORC rule, rating rule specifically. Um, walk us through real quick, um, uh, maybe Mike, you start, and then Kenny, you can dovetail in some of the things that we did uh, specifically on the, on the SEAL plan. Yeah, sure. So as you mentioned, Nick, initially the, um, you know, the boat was designed uh, for IRC racing kind of off the, you know, obviously it was designed for sailing all around the world, but it really was aiming to be very successful in racing, uh, you know, off the Atlantic coast of France and, and kind of in the Solent. Um, and to that end, you know, it was really targeted towards the IRC market. Um, and the IRC, a, you know, kind of works on the system of, um, you know, the boat has a base rating. And then from that base rating, there's a system of, you know, point penalties for different, um, different things on the boat, which you can change. Um, the, some of the penalties that are particularly injurious to your rating are mainsail girth, uh, the sizing of the mainsail girths. So, you know, how fat the mainsail is as it goes up the rig. Um, not including the headboard, um, and the luff length on the jib. So, you know, as 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 close to the apex of the force day as you can get on the jib, um, as well as the length of the bowsprit. So if you, you know, look on, at some of the early boats in Europe, you know, they were, you know, the mainsails were, you know, a little smaller in the girths and the jibs were a little shorter on the luff length, which is great. I mean, that, that that's a very, very, very successful platform um for kind of racing you know in the north atlantic absolutely uh in the us um our dominant rating rule and, and you know in other parts of the world as well our dominant rating rule is you know is and is becoming uh orc which works on a, a velocity prediction program where you know you 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 measure everything you can about the boat and you put it into uh, an algorithm that runs a Velocity prediction program in a computer, and it spits out what the protect what the projected speeds of the boat is in every wind angle and at every um, wind strength. Uh, and then the sailors go out and try and beat that velocity prediction. Um, so when you optimize for ORC, you know there's no you know if I make my jib one foot shorter, I get this rating gain. You just really try and optimize to make the boat as fast as you possibly can. Um, and so to that end. Um, we went with a much larger mainsail and a, a and much taller jib, and we went with a longer bowsprit, which seems to even be paying off in IRC, that one uh, in particular. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really been good to see. Um, Kenny can talk in, a, in, in greater detail about it, but you know, at the base level, optimizing for ORC is optimizing for the, the fastest, most fun boat you can put on the water. Kenny, what, what else could you add in terms of our, you know, working with you and uh... And, and the team both in the Annapolis and Newport lofts and, and things like that. It's, it's really been a fun project. Yeah, well, Al Terhune, um, uh, who's our class head for uh, North Sales is based out of Annapolis with you guys. Uh, he worked really hard as uh, uh, Max Tringali, um, another a really good young designer that we have. One nice thing about the ORC is you can, you can fire off a bunch of certificates and get an idea of where the rule thinks you're going with regards, especially to sail sizes. We 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 certainly sailed with the boat as light as humanly possible. Um, as as Mike knows, I was a tyrant <laughs> about that. Um, we race and um, in that in the in the rule didn't seem to mind that, and we we were making the mainsails bigger and bigger all the time. So we're really filling, like Mike said, we're, we are really maxing out the sail plan uh, on this next few boats. My friend Rob Alexander, Rob and Libby Alexander, uh, are just took delivery, I think, to a, a new 3300 down in Long Island. He's putting it together now, and um, and those sails are yet another size bigger than the sails we used. So, you know, wow. part of this is evolution, but but a fun part of it is it. I think a lot of people, especially in the double-handed realm, really enjoy that that kind of tweaking around. We, you know, we've offered a one design sail, uh, one design set of sails that I think are the right sails for the boat. And in almost every case, um, the person who's ordering the sails right now, you know, they might use Hanks, they might use a head foil, uh, might use two jibs, might only use one, and then the big code zero. So everybody has their own version of what of what 
well, ease of handling for double-handed racing was obviously a big factor, but then how to get the boat to go as fast as possible. So we're in this really fun uh, kind of uh, evolve, evolution, you know, kind of advancement stage right now. And, you know, once we get, if we can get, Al, if we can get Alchemist out sailing against Rob's boat, for example, down in the Sound here soon, then we're going to get a really good idea of big sails versus slightly smaller sails, and and right. and, a, and how much how much you go versus your rating. So it's very, it's a really fun time. I, I I really enjoy this part of it, and the ORC allows you to really kind of play around beforehand with sail sizes that uh, helps you dial in what you're really trying to get out of it. Good. Well, thanks, Kenny, for the for for that, and and uh, you'll be you'll be happy to hear that Bob and Libby are actually you're watching this webinar live. So a uh, shout out to uh, to these guys, and uh, and thank you for uh, for following us. And uh, and following I went to college with Rob, so I, I won't tell a few of the stories. <laughs> no, no stories on this webinar will be allowed. Thirty three hundred sailing right. Actually, I got a few on Libby too, but the problem is they have way more <laughs> than I have on them. So I got to shut up. When I when I told you that we were going to keep it light and, and fun and friendly, I, I didn't mean to go that far. <laughs> no, no, we don't want to go that far. <laughs> so thanks thanks both of you on, on the sales, and we could we could talk all day long about the sales, obviously, and, and there's a lot of things to talk about on the boat and the program and everything. We're getting a lot of questions on the performance of the boat, um, so we'll get to that section um, in a second. Before we get to that section, there's always a lot of talk about cockpit layouts and uh, mm -hmm. and mike i know you have a, a couple photos of of the cockpit and uh, i want to ask you the question um this particular cockpit on the sunfast 33 looks pretty different from what we've seen on prior sunfast like the 32 and the 36 mike can you you know we'll start with you run us through yeah. like what are the main differences and why the choices you know we made at chanel seem to make sense to you yeah, I mean, one of the things, um, one of the things that I think is really kind of engaging and unique about the shorthanded kind of sailing scene, um, at least in Europe, you know, from what I've been able to observe, kind of sitting where I sit in North America, is the boats are really purposely designed to really excel at the kind of ocean racing, um, shorthanded ocean racing they do, you know, the the Trans Quadra race obviously is a is a major race that everybody does there, um, and you know the boats are really sort of optimized for long distance jib reaching, long distance spinnaker sailing, and not really doing a lot of maneuvers. So you know if you look at say you know a Sunfast 3200 or the 3600 uh, in the Tiller version, you know, and and some of the other boats that are that are you know produced for the same use in Europe, um, you see you know for example like twin tillers flared out to the two sides of the boat you see a lot of sail controls sort of you know led to the helming station and maybe one crew station um whereas here in north america most of the racing we do is around the buoys right and so and, and i should say fully crewed around the buoys and then so you know we're used to seeing boats you know maybe more like a like a j80 or an lg24 or something like that where you know there there are these fully crewed boats and if you want to go offshore racing and then you can take them offshore but their first use is sort of around the buoys so in north america our kind of um visual aesthetic and what we're used to seeing is these you know kind of user-friendly open cockpit um designs um as opposed to to the north american eye what looks like a more cluttered cockpit you know so in this boat um it kind of puts one foot in the European world and one foot in the North American world where, you know, you, you look at this image of the cockpit, we have, you know, wide open spaces, plenty of room for a full crew. We have a single tiller, you know, the transom is pretty open, um, but all the sail controls are still led to those crew stations. You know, when you look at um, right, I don't know if you can see the mouse, but right here, it's every control you need to adjust the jib. You know, you have in, out, up, down, as well as a code zero tweaker. But none of it gets in your way when you're trying to do a fully crewed um, race maneuver. So, you know, the cockpit aesthetic delivers something that I think really appeals to North American sailors and the functionality, I guess, appeals to everybody is what I'm saying. So um, I think it's a really smart uh, divergence from the, you know, kind of the traditional look of the Sunfast line, you know. That's my opinion on that. 
Great, great. Kenny, any, anything you wanted to add about the cockpit and what you liked about the cockpit and the layout of the of this of the SunFast? And you did a lot of sail changes on that race down to Key West, so uh, you must have explored every corner of that cockpit. Uh, no question. So I, I always accuse my French sailing friends of having stock and rope companies because um, the the French um, the French d way of doing things is lots more rope and lots of purchase and fewer winches. So it is a little something to get used to. I, I've seen that they've maybe upped the spec on the primary winches for the for the next group of boats coming out. Um, but it, it is definitely you got to get used to the rope. There's a lot of rope. I mean, I, I, in essence, a couple changes, I look like a mummy. It's laying in the bottom of the cockpit, you know, and, and um, but, but once you get used to it, the beauty of it is you can drive the boat. It's kind of like the good old days sailing a J24 where the, the jib trim came to you, uh, the main trim came to you, the backstays came to you, the traveler came, everything came to one person to, to really dial the whole uh, tune of the boat and the feel of the boat. You get the same feeling here. Everything come, everything points at uh, the shorthanded sailor in, in, at, at this stage, which I think is really key. It's very cool. I think if, if you, there's definitely a few uh, things I would probably eliminate or just take out of its the system off if you were going to do more crew, uh, a, a larger crew. So it's adaptable to both. Like Mike said, it does appear to be really nicely adaptable to both. But, but man, oh man, somebody's got a contract with rope with a rope dealer. <laughs> there. Holy smokes, it is really impressive. <laughs> well, great. That, thanks, Kenny, for the for the feedback and uh, and uh, and yeah, we were looking forward to more double-handed racing for sure. Uh, and uh, and the cockpit seems to be set up perfectly for for that. Um, Mike, just a, a quick one to conclude on the on the section where we talk about ORC uh, mm. specifically. Um, we, a lot, you know, for our American viewers that are on the webinar today, um, you know, other than the sales themselves, are there anything else that, on the boat that is radically different from a European boat? Um, in the end, we didn't we didn't change anything. There were talks about the bow spritz, but in the yeah. end, yeah. So initially, um, initially, you know, if you find some of the early um, marketing photos from hull number one, um, which was sailed very well in Europe, um, you see a very short kind of snubby bow sprit, um, which is a very common um, IRC. Uh, IRC feature where you know they figure out where the the boat rates even with a short bow sprit and whatever length articulating spinnaker pole you know symmetric spinnaker spinnaker pole um, works with that and the or, or works with that to work out to an even rating and the history there is that when they do this transquadra race you know they reach to some lonely spot in the ocean and then put the spinnaker up and they're on a long starboard jive all the way to Guadalupe at some point. So you know, they, they set the boats up to go basically straight downwind. Um, you know, whereas in the US where, you know, we do a lot more reaching and then we're also more used to, um, I guess boats that sail like very hot angles. Um, and in the ORC, you know, we're less penalized for having a longer bow spread. So you know, we, we built the boat uh, with a couple different prototypes initially to see which one was going to work out better. So obviously for North America, they sent us a boat with a longer bow sprit and they sent the one with the short bow sprit to the IRC market in Europe. Uh, you know, it just sort of seems like the boat's really performing to the longer uh, bow sprit level. So something we initially optimized for ORC in North America, but we, it appears like it's going to be an IRC gainer as well. So that'll be you know, much more common and probably be the standard way of delivering the boat, unless a customer in Europe or uh, somebody interested in sailing IRC somewhere wants to go with the shorter sprit for for that reason. Um, beyond that, uh, we've done a few sail control modifications just to allow us to deal with the larger sail sizing um, right. that we developed for North America. Um, so we changed, um, on, on our boat, Alchemist, we changed out the backstays to be just a fiddle style three to one that are led to the primary winch. Mm -hmm. That seems to work really well. Um, and we increased the purchase on the Boom Bang and the Cunningham. Um, and beyond, beyond that, I mean, you know, it's the stock standard boat that comes off the line. 
that's great. And that's obviously one of the big advantages because we're all we're all looking at boats that have a common base. So for us, yeah. with our, you know, our obviously the, the desire to, to see many of these boats racing around, it's a big looking at a common base where we haven't you know, completely modified a lot of the details other than, like you said, some of the uh, the way the purchases are done and, and things like that. Well, that, yeah. that's Mike, awesome. Mike, do you have that photo, the photo that has the different numbers uh, on each of the stations of the boat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess. So this, so I think this, the North American boat, if I remember you guys telling me correctly, at number two, it has a slightly longer bow spread. Um, yeah. Certainly the inner jib, um, the, you know, the helix jib at number one, uh, Genoa at number one, and the inner helix jib at number three. Um, number six is the boom, and we've actually lengthened the foot of, of the mainsail quite a bit to really utilize the boom, and that those IRC boats were really short from the end of the boom yeah. uh, over in Europe. And then, like you said, the the square top on, on the main has gotten bigger, kind of, again, kind of North American ORC-centric. And, yeah. uh, and the jib is, is absolutely maxed out to fit in that four triangle as much as possible. So, um, you know, the deck, the deck gear and the deck layout seem to handle it. Like Mike said, we just increased the purchase on a couple of things. And, and besides that, pull it up and in and send it, you know, it, it really, yeah. uh, really pretty, pretty good, pretty easy. Great. Well, thanks for, thanks for that. And I think, I think we've, we've talked about a lot of the different things in terms of the ORC optimization and our next and third category in the conversation is one that everybody's uh, waiting for. We've talked to, uh, we get a lot of questions on the chat for that is the, is the, is the performance of the boat. Um, so b based on everything that we've talked about, the optimization and everything, I'll start with you, Mike, you know, with the rig, the keel and the hot concaves, how has the boat performed? Let's say our perimeter, what we know here in North America compared to the competition that's out here, which might be a little bit different than what we see in, uh, in Europe, of course, but tell us a little bit about your experience, Mike, out here first racing the boat. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it's it's kind of a fun process to sort of take the boat out of the box and figure out what makes it go fast. Um, so, so far, I've been very, very pleased with the performance of the boat. Um, you know, in IRC, uh, it's about a 1.03. And then uh, ORC, the GPH is just a little over 600. Um, and it, it, it sails to those numbers, um, you know, very well. Um, like every brand new boat, um six months ago we were we in the first race we did we were struggling to get uh the boat to point very high uh when sailing upwind in light air um but as kenny will tell you with every brand new boat you just make the force stay longer and longer and longer until it points where you want it to <laughs> uh and now we're going uh now we're going just fine in all conditions so we've been i've been very very pleased with the performance of the boat and the ratings we've got back from um both IRC and ORC, I've been very pleased with the performance. It, it does fine. You did a first race, Mike, in the Chesapeake Bay, a, a double-handed yeah. race organized by the by the Annapolis Yacht Club. Tell us a little bit about how that went. Well, yeah. So that race, um, <laughs> we got a little uh, we got a little unlucky from a forecast perspective. I was sailing with um, with Kate Muller Trahune, and we. Um, you know, when the race started, it was a it was a really kind of fun breezy jib reach for you know three miles or so, um, and you know got a kind of an 80 true wind angle and about 16 knots of breeze. And we, as the video, you know, Nick, you made a video of it. We had a terrible start, um, but we were able uh, at a jib reach to sort of punch through the competition. And we led at the first starting mark to, to turn up wind. I mean, we were passing 38 footers uh to lure you know boats that are six feet longer than our boat so um you know what it's designed to do uh, and that is reach powered up hard the boat does extremely well um after you know after kind of the first mark the race sort of dribbled into being this kind of you know 35 hour upwind and seven knots of breeze race and you know the, the the traditional war horses did really well, you know, a J35-1 and, um, you know, boats that are designed to go upwind um, really, really did really well. Um, but, you know, like I said, we've been tweaking the boat and we've been doing a lot better and 
you know, since lengthening the force day, it's been going up wind incredibly well. Yeah, and I think one of the things that comes up very, very regularly for those that have experience with 32s and 3600s is that um, <clears throat> this new design, and obviously Guillaume Verdier is a, is a, is a, is a key to that, and, and working with Daniel Landrier has given us a lot mm -hmm. better upwind performance than we've ever had on the uh, on, on the Sun Fast range. Um, Jenny, yeah, your, your experience was uh, was in a Fort Lauderdale to, to Key West race. Um, you know, you, you were obviously um, like we said, there was there were only two boats in a double-handed division, but you had a lot of other boats around you. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, what was your initial perception on on the performance of the boat? Well, you know, the, some some races, some race tracks, and some races are far more uh, telling with regards to your rating versus your. You know, so, so some races tell you my rating really wasn't very good, or my rating was great. Some just tell you I, we sailed really well, or we really didn't sail very well. It, this this was I can't say that this was either. It, it was a strange race, <laughs> full of squalls, really hard to judge. When we had drag race conditions for a while, especially with this combination up, we were very fast, and and um, we were with you know 38 to 40 footers until the evening until it got light and really weird and uh i think probably the double-handed aspect of it didn't help us out there because others could change quite a bit quicker got a little lighter kind of light air downwind so we were probably sailing to our rating but i kept looking at our rating compared to all the boats that were around us all the boats that were around us started in front of us and uh and we're sailing with them or ahead of them so my inclination is to say it, it seems fine um, but I, I think the jury's still out. A, I think there's still probably, like Mike said, with a, a new boat, there's still more work to be done. Um, the learning curve on a boat like this is steep, super steep. So the more people that get into these boats, the, the better they will go. And, uh, and the more you find out about its tendencies, every boat, listen, every boat has weaknesses, every boat has strengths. The, the objective is gather as many strengths as you can and really minimize your weaknesses. Uh, this is the fun part of of new designs of new boats is you get to play and, and that's the fun part so so i think the playing's just started on this boat and it's it's not going to get slower and it's not going to get worse rated i guarantee you that because smart <laughs> people are having at it you know and, and like all new boats when smart people when smart sailors have that good, good pedigree boats the sky's the limit it's fantastic well, we've we've definitely we know we have a great base and we've assembled a good team of uh, of uh, of sailmakers and, uh, and and racing experts around to help all of our owners out there uh, set up the boat and what works for them uh, in in the competition. And like you said, I can't wait to have Alchemist and, and some of the other boats, uh, you know, go up against one another and against some other boats on the racing uh, circuit. And obviously, this COVID-19 has sort of put a little bit of a dent in our in our program for the spring. But uh, we're going to come back even stronger when uh, when this when when this thing is is all over for sure. Um, yeah. Jenny, I know I know one of the things that we talk about that a lot is you know you you think about what the designers had intended on doing, and and I know you've communicated specifically uh, with Guillaume and Danielle, the co-architect on this boat. Um, and one of the questions is is always the same. You know, it's like did it come out exactly like the way they wanted it to come out? And uh, and I wanted to ask you, you know, you've seen a lot of boat projects. Uh, you know, what's your what's your feeling on uh, on that and and uh, and the and the end result there? Even though we continue to make it faster and better. Well, I think every designer and every uh, good sailor on the planet would love to have an all carbon boat that weighs nothing and costs about twenty million dollars to build. You know, so some, somehow we have to find this equilibrium yeah. halfway in between and. Uh, both Danielle and Guillaume have been were very helpful leading up to um, the, the beginning of the project with Alchemist. Uh, Guillaume more on the general concept side, and Danielle on the uh, on kind of the VPP uh, sale area, more more the kind of the rating optimization side. So they have great strengths there. But I think um, really to answer your question. This, what I what I was very impressed with, and I can't help myself, is after every time I go sailing on a boat, I write my list. You know, here's here's the pros, here's the cons, and of course, in my mind, I'm always 100% right. So there's no other there's no other alternative. And <laughs> uh, 
I've been very impressed uh, that that uh, all your all your compatriots over in France are are absolutely listening to sailors' opinions and views as to what we're using, what we're not using, what may be extraneous, what may be imperative, um, and really and really listening. So that's all you can ask for. Listen, the, the boat is what it is, right? The concept is what it is. Mm -hmm. How do you make it better? And is the is are the designers and the builders going to work with you? And I've always been um, most successful in my sailing career when I can get a whole team of people to work around a project. And whether it's a, a 33 footer or whether it's a hundred footer or and anything in between, when you get a team to work together, um, it's for the good of all. And, and I really get that feeling it, that there's a team behind it that's uh, working and taking sailor input and uh, using them. And they could, they, this could be tiny tweaks, tiny little things, but you know what? That all adds up at, at the end of the day. Absolutely. And, and, and for all of you out there, again, listening, you know, the team, the team here at Genoa America and a network of dealers around the country are, are, are here as a, uh, as a linkage point to, uh, to make sure that we set up the boat exactly right for you. Um, we're getting a few questions uh, that are that are coming through, and we talked about the boat. Can you can you tell us about the sails, for example? Like, have you already envisaged like if you get back up on Alchemist, uh, would you still do some slightly different things on the sails side than what you had in Fort Lauderdale? Obviously, you'd be racing in a different area, New England versus Florida. But yeah. just in, in one sentence, can you, if, if you could, because time is short, tell us what you know? What are the things that you'd be looking for next on the sails side of things? Well, R Rob and Libby's sales are the next generation. You know that that, that next that next set is gonna, has all the little tweaks, a um, little bigger main, a um, little bigger code zero, uh, same staysail setup, a um, couple different jib options. But you know, for the most part, um, it's just this was a big jump to this inventory from what was being sailed with in IRC over in Europe, and then now. The, the jumps get smaller and smaller and smaller to the to the point where they're they're done. So I, I think th this next step, I can't wait to see uh, Rob and Libby's sales because I think that's going to be a nice step. Good, great, and we'll, of course the team at North is always available. Like you were saying earlier, Alan and the rest of the team are, are available to help out all of our owners out there. A um, couple more questions that are coming through from uh, from the audience out there, uh, Mike. I wanted to ask you. Uh, we didn't talk about the carbon mast. Um, is there anything right. specific in terms of rating on the ORC regarding the carbon mast versus aluminum mast? Obviously, we made a, a decision for the way we're bringing the boats in North America. In, in just one sentence, what could you tell us to answer that question? Yeah, I mean, ORC, uh, as, as we were saying, uh, does a VPP, so uh, the, the, the mast will have a weight, uh, and that affects the riding moment of the boat. Um, and so, theoretically, um, the lighter the mast, the greater the writing moment, the uh, higher the rating. Um, so, you know, theoretically, you can say that the aluminum rig, um, since it weighs more, the boat should uh, rate a little better. Um, however, it's important to note that in smaller boats, that's a bit of an issue of diminishing returns, yeah. where, you know, the the rating hit you get for a theory aluminum with a heavier rig isn't really realized in the actual weight of the gear. You know what I mean? Yep, absolutely. So you know, so I would advocate going for a uh, you know, use going for the carbon rig. Personally. The carbon rig, absolutely. I think it's been our choice as we decided to set up the boats as close from a spec standpoint for the North American market as possible, so that we can have some fun time in the water competing against each other. Yeah, it's important to note just real quick from a size perspective, everything is the same, you know, they're in the same spots, the sails fit the same, you know, it's it's literally just the, what the tube's made out of. Quick question on the performance uh, uh, before we move to the last section of the presentation and talk a little bit about the future plan for the boat, but um, mm -hmm. maybe Kenny, you can talk to us about the forgiveness of the boat with this twin rudder and this hull design. Did you ever get in, it, in any situation uh, racing down the Key West where you were like, Okay, this is great. I'm I'm in control of this boat all the time, and, and obviously it's an important factor in short-handed racing. Um, hmm. um, did you ever get in any situation like this? I uh, just ramped it up to about 22 degrees of heel and let it rip. You know, it's especially when the boat's going fast. I think most boats, when most boats are going fast, the rudders work well and they're super efficient, and you'd have no control. 
a few times when we were in the middle of squalls and we had a uh, you know had the kite up believe it or not um trying to get rid of the kite you know it, we probably pressed the high end a little too much but it never felt crazy um uh listen twin rudders have been around for a long time now and uh and it's nice to see them trickle down to boats this size they work especially like mike said reaching offshore uh yeah. and powered up offshore yeah seems like the right move for, for me and the whole system worked really well great well that's that's awesome thank you for uh thank you for the the, the specifics on that um, so let's let's move to the last section of the of the presentation because time is running out. It's already 3:50 here. We've got about 10 minutes uh, uh, left together. Um, so Mike, I'll start with you first. We had a whole plan laid out. I was sort of hinting to it earlier uh, before coronavirus hit. Um, what what are what are we today? What, what's 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 the vibe? And then we'll we'll obviously. Let Kenny talk to us a little bit about his thoughts on double-handed racing, specifically in North America, but also around the globe. But Mike, why don't you start? Tell us a little bit what you had planned, and uh, and so uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you know, we when we we introduced the boat really in North America at the Annapolis Boat Show. Um, obviously, there was some uh, there was some buzz about it kind of going around before that, but that was our North American introduction. Um, that was where I uh, got to talk to Rob on the phone, Rob Alexander on the phone for a while about the boat. Um, you know, since then we've had some great traction and a lot of interest um, kind of around the country. Um, if you include our factory demo boat, we're on track to have six boats in North America um, kind of throughout the summer. Um, with a, a good chunk of them in that New England area. So our plan was to bring Alchemist uh, hull number four uh, up to Long Island Sound. And our intention was to do the Block Island race, hopefully um, with the Alexanders. Um, but obviously that race has kind of gotten punted uh, due to coronavirus. Um, we had hoped to you know, potentially have two or three boats doing the Newport to Bermuda race, but that race is also um, kind of circling the drain or i think it's outright canceled at this point um and so we're kind of shifting our focus to be a little bit later in the summer where you know the sunfast 3300 family can make a splash as a fleet um so what we're targeting and hoping for um is the ida lewis distance race in newport which is middle of august um we're kind of hoping you know everybody's back on their feet a little bit uh by then and you know kind of the all the bans on recreational boating have been lifted and we can get together as you know friends and racers again um and so we're hoping we're hoping um to make that kind of our uh debut as the sunfast 3300 fleet um and our hope is to start there moving forward um you know to have three or four boats at that uh ida lewis event and we're going to sort of wade into the water there as a sponsor of the event and you know kind of make that a you know, a yearly sort of, you know, some fast 3300 um, mainstay. Um, and then going on from there, you know, we have the, the ORC World Championships in Newport in September. Um, and then the uh, the uh, Annapolis Yacht Club double-handed distance race down here in October. So, you know, the sport of sailing isn't going anywhere. Um, you know, we, we went through a little, a little blip in the action the first uh, half of this year, maybe the first third of this year. Um, but, you know, I, you know, double handed sailing is already kind of a wave that was rising in the U.S. Um, and so our hope for the 3300 is to you know, ride the front edge of that wave, um, support the sailors that have been kind enough to get invested in our group and buy the boats, and work together with them and grow our fleet um, to the point where we have a you know, pretty strong um, semi one design, semi box rule uh, group of boats racing all over North America. So guys, I have news for you. Flash just happened a minute ago. The decision was made that uh, Alchemist is moving to New England. So uh, we've been carrying this project uh, as you know, America from Annapolis uh, since the boat arrived in October. But Glenn Walter, our dealer from uh, from uh, Newport, Rhode Island, is going to take over the boat and uh, hey. uh, to campaign the boat with uh, with you, Kenny. Hopefully, uh, as much as we can. So uh, just literally learned the news. So we're very excited to uh, to see it. Good, Fantastic. Uh, good continuation of life for uh, for uh, for alchemist 
So Kenny, tell us, I mean, obviously, you know, this whole double-handed thing is, is, is kind of the timing of it with coronavirus is kind of incredible when you think about it. I mean, it's, it's a difficult event for, for, you know, for a lot of people, uh, but there's some silver lining. What, what, are, your, what are your sort of final thoughts on, on double-handed racing in general and the position of a boat like the Sunfast 3300 in that? Well, I'm all for getting boats off the dock. That's really my, um, that's my mantra, not just these days, but for the last several years. So as, as kind of industry leaders, we need to find ways to get people interested in sailing. So whether you have an old boat around, uh, around or a brand new boat like this, um, th there is a little bit of retrofit, kind of fun retrofitting that people can do to get some double-handed sailing going. And it, you know, my brother, my brother, Brad, who runs Sail Newport, they're looking for ways to get regattas going again, you know, and with the social distancing restrictions and the state restrictions, it sure looks like double hand, single and double handed racing is going to be the quickest and easiest way to get there, uh, to get back on the water and to go sailboat racing. So it is amazing uh, from a timing standpoint. But if you mix in U.S. sailing and the world in the worldwide interest in this in this uh, Olympic event in 2024 and the double-handed event there, um, it's really kind of creating a bit of a perfect storm. And like I said before, and I want to be adamant, there's a lot of people, the Paul Cronins and the Rich Demoulins of the world, uh, the Tristan Moulinier's that that have been double-handed racing up around here for a long time. We have just haven't been smart enough to figure out that it's really, really fun. And, and it takes a boat like this to come along and, and the partnership that we formed between North and Genoa to, to figure out how to how to put it all together and to join up with these guys and girls to, to get out there on the water and to have more fun. So Ida Lewis Distance, uh, the, the Solo Twin, uh, hopefully there even there might be a little hint that there could be a double-handed division in the IRC ORC worlds. Um, you know, let, let's just let's see how this goes. Every day is different. Every day changes. Um, but the sooner we can all get back on the water, and I think the double-handed part of, part of the sailing uh, is going to get us back on the water the quickest to to get out there sailboat racing. Yeah, we were just as excited as you are, Kenny, for sure. Um, I think that you know there's there's a really bright future for this sport, and I think we have a perfect boat to uh, to actually uh, to actually tackle that and uh, and make the sport even even bigger. Um, obviously, you just found out uh, you know that we we will have uh, our our initial demo boat, Alchemist, move to New England. So I know a lot of you uh, want to know uh, you know where can I see a boat right now? And you heard it from Michael. So we have six boats coming. Um, I think, Mike, we also have a boat obviously going to the Chicago area, if I'm not mistaken, right? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I think it's getting delivered in the next couple of weeks, unless there's some crazy hang-up with travel, or shipping, I mean. Good, good. So there'll be boats on the East Coast and then, and then hopefully a boat in the Great Lakes. And we're also looking forward to introducing a boat out west in the San Francisco Bay Area as soon as we possibly can. So uh, uh, lots and lots of fun, uh, of fun projects to... Uh, to be uh, to be continuing to work on and uh, and our objective is clearly to to you know to make a a, a big sunfast 3300 fleet so that all our owners can have fun racing uh, against one another and, and against other other uh, other boats as well so we've got two minutes to go until the end of this webinar we've gotten a lot of other really great questions uh, on the chat unfortunately it's hard to to get to them all but uh, we have all those questions recorded and we'll be contacting um, each of you and, and, uh, and answering uh, those questions after the webinar is over. Uh, Mike Coe, uh, um, of course, is our product specialist and, and project manager for the 3300 in the, in the team here at, uh, at Genoa America. I want to take a moment to thank Kenny very much for his participation. I know you do it because you have a lot of fun doing it more than anything. And uh, you, you're an incredible voice for the sport of sailing and the sport of sailboat racing in particular. So uh, from the entire Geno team and all our owners out there, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for having accepted to be on our, on our panel today. And uh, Mike, again, thank you. Thank you to all our owners who uh, I saw at least three or four of our owners already connected. We talked about uh, uh, these, uh, these folks in New England. We're looking forward to seeing everyone on the, uh, on the water. So everybody stay safe, a bit more patience. We're already in let's go mode. Let's get back out there mode here at Geno America. And, uh, and for those of you who follow our social media, you'll see a big shift 
in our communication uh, in the next few days as, uh, as we get ready to get back out there safely um, and respecting social distancing, of course, uh, but, uh, but uh, we're looking forward to seeing everyone out on the water. So thank you so much for everybody's attention this afternoon and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on the water. Kenny, Mike, see you on the water, guys. Thanks, Nick. Bye-bye. Take care.